Welcome to another episode of Noah Knows, the science of health and fitness. I am your host, the bearded bullshit buster and swally scientist, and today we have a very special episode as we have three iconic guests with us. We have uh, David Mathis from Team BioLane, who has a master's in exercise science and is also a Army veteran combat medic. Uh, then we have Mike Isratel, PhD, uh, sports physiology, who is the founding or one of the founding member, members of Renaissance Periodization and also dressed up as a Disney princess this Halloween. So go check that post out. <laughs> and then uh, last but certainly not least, we have Spencer Nadoski, who is probably one of the only doctors of his type in the country, MD, board certified mm -hmm. in obesity family medicine, preventative medicine, and also has a master's in public health. So guys, uh, welcome to the show. I'm honored to have you all here with me. Oh, it's a pleasure, man. Thank you for having me. Thanks for having us, buddy. Absolutely. Yahoo. <laughs> all right. So um, we're going to get right into it. We're going to ask the most important question of the day here. And David, that's how old are you? It's your birthday. Yeah, I should just uh, today I turned 35. So it's a, it's a good birthday present for me. You get, you get to be on with these gentlemen. So thank you guys. Happy birthday, buddy. I appreciate it. Maybe I'll start looking like I'm 35 and not 18. You know, <laughs> I actually just shaved, I actually just shaved my beard, or else I probably would look like I'm at least 30. <laughs> it's the autophagy. You're fasting so much. Yep, it's all that intermittent fasting, and uh, you know, Game Changers was a real eye-opener for me so <laughs> change the game for it then. all right so um i want to start out with a uh a, a question here or a direct quote from you david and it's really the you know the the question that brought us uh all together here and it's looking at uh the the question or the topic of is a steroid use when controlled uh, alternatively more healthy or better for you and uh in comparison to being overweight or obese. So the direct quote that I pulled from your profile, uh, quote, steroids, can they be dangerous? Yes, when abused, but guess what? So can food when it's abused. So uh, take us through that statement. Um, I want to make it clear, like this was geared more towards, you know, uh, like HRT. This wasn't hardcore steroids not Anavar, not Dietinabol, none of that stuff. This was mostly for health reasons. And the reason why this really, um, this kind of came to the forefront for me is just dealing with my own health issues in the past. Um, most, uh, Mike, Spencer, you guys probably don't know this. Um, when I was in the army, I actually became anorexic and nearly lost my life. Um, and ever since then, my testosterone just has never really fully recovered. And so I started thinking about the concept of HRT and how it can have a lot of health benefits because we know low testosterone causes a lot of um, a lot of health issues in people. And then I started thinking about from the other aspect of it, um, the other end of it, like how many people out there are smoking all the time, um, drinking, you know, abusing alcohol, abusing other drugs. Um, and steroids just get such a bad rap because they're, they're misunderstood. Um, and there are people out there that do abuse them, but I think under the proper medical attention, um, you know, proper blood work taken regularly, um, under a supervised physician's care, I think that it can actually help improve some of these health issues that men in particular see from low testosterone levels. Um, but steroids gets thrown into this big giant bubble of being bad and being, you know, um, kind of blackballed by the community and stuff when in reality, taking steroids could actually improve someone's health. Um, and then you see these people, like I said, they're, they're eating fast food all the time. They're overly, they're really obese. They're smoking and drinking all the time, but yet no one talks about how that is, you know, dangerous for you, but you, you bring up the word steroids and everybody thinks, Oh my God, it's the most horrible thing in the world. So that's kind of the premise of that post just to kind of shed some light and give a new perspective to people to think about. I'm not trying to persuade someone to do steroids. I'm not trying to not, I'm just trying to bring it to the forefront that there are many, many unhealthy factors that people partake in on a daily basis that nobody really, nobody really brings up and talks about, um, or criticizes in the same way that as soon as you hear the word steroids, they do. So. 
So I think it's a, it's important. So based off of what you're saying, it's important to kind of delineate the difference between like a pathological state of hypogonadism, where there's certainly increased risk of all sorts of chronic disease and bringing your testosterone levels to a physiologic level, which would be in a non-pathological state uh, versus recreational steroid use. And I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even put someone that's using testosterone replacement therapy in the category of somebody using anabolic exogenous non-testosterone steroids for physiologic purposes. So I'd make sure to make sure we put these, you know, in different categories because someone with anorexia, I see a lot of these patients. So a lot of times, you know, people as they age, is age-related decreases in testosterone, even pathologic. People, that's a big argument. But a lot of the hypogonadism we see are secondary from obesity and lifestyle nowadays anyway. Uh, and, and, you know, there's controversy whether we should give testosterone versus lifestyle, yada, yada, yada. But in, in the fitness world, in the dieting world, on Instagram and all over, you know, it used to be forums, now it's the you know, it's, Facebook and now you get an Instagram. I see a lot of, um, yeah, male kind of anorectic uh, type of patients or those chronic dieters who in that hypogonadic area and, uh, you know, they regain some weight and still they're still hypogonadal just from the chronic relative energy deficiency or whatever you want to call it uh, syndrome, similar to happens to females who lose their period and never get it back. So, um, replacing their testosterone. I wouldn't say that that person's using steroids. I'd say we're treating them therapeutically. So it's, it's different than, than say, um, it's uh, just before we get into like maybe the discussion, we want to make sure we, we have a correct characterization yeah. of, of. And I absolutely agree with you. That's, um, there is a big difference between testosterone replacement for, you know, HRT and hardcore bodybuilding steroids and stuff and um i still i still think though that there's more that needs to be looked at from unhealthy lifestyle factors that needs to be um there just needs to be more emphasis placed on that i mean i know we hear about being overweight is bad and you should stop drinking and all that but i don't think people really understand that those negative lifestyle factors can be equally as dangerous even if even as you know abusing anabolic steroids. And so I, I don't think there's any question that, um, it needs to be put into context. I, I was mostly looking at this from the, you know, hormone replacement standpoint from the health standpoint. Um, but I still do feel that there are, there are steps and there are precautions that can be taken. And we've seen plenty of professional bodybuilders that get out of the sport and are healthy afterwards. So I think that it can be done um, your health can be monitored if, you know, taken under the right precautions with physicians, um, guidance and stuff. Whereas people that smoke and drink and do all this stuff for years and years on end, um, they don't really get criticized as much as someone that takes steroids. And I just think that's, I think that's kind of unfair. I think the context needs to be, you know, considered. You're saying there. There's a stigma, a much stronger stigma among those anabolic steroids compared to those who smoke or have otherwise unhealthy. Is that what you, you're saying? People have this, they're stigmatized, right? Right. Okay. Yeah, I don't doubt that. Um, Mike, what are your what are your thoughts? I mean, I, I think, you know, when uh, Noah asked us to be in the discussion, I if we're going to kind of have a little bit of a debate of something, make sure we're comparing apples to apples, whether it's obesity to those who use, you know, anabolic steroids and an otherwise metabolically health, healthy individual, or, or we can just discuss it all and the nuances of it all, which we will anyway, but yeah, uh, I, um, the, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you there, Mike, the, yeah. the, the reason why I wanted to do this and I, I, I give credit to, to David for bringing this up because I, I, speaking with him prior to this, I know he took a lot of heat uh, for even bringing up this idea. And I think that inherently is part of the problem is that the dis even the discussion of uh, steroids, whether it be, uh, you know, abused or controlled or, or for medical use is so taboo that we just don't 
there, there may not be enough knowledge about it, right? Having discussions like this or making the subject of steroids not taboo, where we can openly talk about it and have more research available to see what are the health benefits and what can be the uh, health risks, right, can inform someone to make a much better decision in terms of, hey, you know what, this isn't for me, I'm not going to do it, or, um, you know, maybe there is a problem and I should seek out a doctor, right? It's, it's, it's just about, you know, exploring and uh, finding uh, the correct information so there aren't so many confused people on, on the subject. Yeah, I think that's, um, that was pretty much the intention. I wasn't trying to tell anybody they need to take steroids. I just wanted to start a discussion, which you've been able to bring us all together. And hopefully just, I, I think that the stigma happens because like you said, there, there's not enough education about it. Um, people hear all the negative stories about steroids. They don't hear enough of the positive benefits that can come from them. You know, you've got things like, I mean, for, for men specifically, um, you got ED, right? You got loss of muscle mass as you get older. You've got um, depression that sets in from low testosterone. Um, and people think, yeah, I think always trying to change your lifestyle is the first and foremost, you know, thing you should do. But that's not always going to solve everything. And Spencer, you, you noted that too. Like you can, if someone is that far, you know, low on testosterone, it can only get up to a certain point. And as you age, it's not actually going to get any more, right? It's only going to start decreasing. So I think that there needs to be more of a discussion of looking into certain steroids to help improve your health as you get older. I'm not even just talking about for building muscle mass and being a bodybuilder. I'm just talking about for health reasons moving forward. And I still think that there's a lot of people out there that they're not even open to that suggestion because they hear the word steroids and it, automatically has the stigma associated with it. I wonder how many people think that HRT is the same thing as steroids, um, especially if they get it, uh, information by their doctor or something, or somebody suggests it. Like, let's say they're struggling and they're 43 years old and they go get blood work and the testosterone is low. And the doctor says, you know, as replacement therapy is an option. I wonder what fraction of people immediately connote replacement therapy with I'm injecting the same steroids as bodybuilders do every week. I'm now doing steroids. Uh, I happen to think it's probably pretty low, although that's a wild guess. Um, most people think TRT is a really different class of behavior than taking steroids. There are people that compete in drug-free federations that are on testosterone replacement therapy and get an exemption. Um, but, uh, yeah, there, there is a, there, there is, I think, uh, something that you pointed out that, you know, folks that are maybe themselves not in the greatest shape will drink heavily, smoke and to be considerably over fat. And, uh, we'll talk about how steroids will kill you and they sure will. Uh, everything really kind of kills you, but it depends on how much and for how long and what. Uh, and then you start getting into that discussion, you realize that steroids are a lot like obesity in the sense it sort of depends on how overweight you are. You know, if you're overweight by 10 or 20 pounds, you could say that's like high end TRT to low, low end bodybuilding doses. It probably has a health effect over a long period of time, but the statistics on, uh, the, you know, the comprehensive reviews of literature for cohort studies over a lifetime really have a difficult time picking apart exactly how bad it is to be 10 or 20 pounds overweight. Uh, we know much more than that. It's definitely bad in an increasing exponential fashion, but 10 or 20 pounds, there's even been some literature that says sometimes it's protective at older ages, so on and so forth. And Spencer might be able to speak to some of that. And that's, you know, dosing probably in the 100 to 300 milligram exogenous range of testosterone per week, sort of equivalent, where I would have a hard time saying the 300 milligrams of test a week is going to make you healthier than average. I would even have a hard time saying that it's going to make you as healthy and have as long, much longevity on average as someone who doesn't take that much. But the, uh, if someone was to say, look, you know, I have a buddy who's on you know 250 test every week or 300 every week. And he never goes above that. Is he going to die real soon? I'd be like, no, absolutely not. And, you know, especially if he's keeping his blood work in check. 
he'll probably die like two years earlier than he was supposed to or something like that. And maybe we can't even say that much. But with uh, steroid use, just like with obesity, the more you use and for longer, sort of like the fatter you are and for longer you're fat, the more extreme things get. And then you get up to the real extremes. You have very serious, um, relatively short-term danger. So for example, and Spencer could probably speak to this much more after I'm done ranting, but you know, if you weigh up to about 200 pounds at average male height, your doctor says, uh, yeah, like, well, you know, look, Bob, you should probably lose some weight. If you weigh up to 300 pounds, the conversation shifts to, look, you, you want to see your grandchildren or not. If you weigh up to 400 pounds, the conversation is like, you know, the next five to 10 years might be your last as an as a ambulatory individual who doesn't need assistance. They also might be your last. Uh, and then an uh, individual in the five, 600 pound range is all, almost an acute risk for uh, about a thousand things going wrong at any one point. Anytime you wake up and you're in normal health at that body weight is sort of a good lucky roll of the dice. And the same thing can be used for steroid use. If you're using up to about a gram of exogenous gear, you're definitely not doing your health any favors, but you're probably not going to drop that anytime soon. If you're using, you know, in the two to five gram range, you're definitely... <laughs> Uh, not doing yourself any favors and you're going to have to monitor blood work a lot or every now and again go down because you're going to accumulate some nasty health detriments. But if you're in the five gram plus range per week, which is a lot, uh, a lot to inject into your own body, then you're really rolling the dice on, you know, do I have another five, 10, 10 to 10 years of life or am I going to be the lucky guy that lives another 20 to 30? So um, there's definitely that same mirror image. But I will say to your point, uh, uh, Davis, that like when someone who is 420 pounds says, oh, man, the steroids are killing those people, you got to do one of these skeptical eyebrows like, oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> but I don't know why you think you're safe. <laughs> like you, you say that as if you are just a great, you know, think a 130 pound vegan says that and be like, oh, respect. You're totally right. These stupid steroid dopers, these junkies that are trying to kill themselves. But if someone's considerably over fat and don't do we all have that relative at home that we see like once a year at thanksgiving he's like tell you what these pro athletes um, as he eats another chicken thigh these steroid users are all getting they're gonna die and you're like speaking of death uncle frank how much do you what is, what is your ejection fraction he's like what the fuck is that you're like uh, <laughs> you should probably listen when your doctor says stuff i'm sure he says a, a lot about it <laughs> look at you the size of your ankles <laughs> anyway spencer what do you think about all that yeah, so exactly what you're saying. It's 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 a clinical manifestation of each of what we're talking about: obesity and exogenous use. I, you know, I know some some really healthy, seemingly healthy, clinically healthy anabolic steroid users. I also know some clinically metabolically healthy and even otherwise healthy uh, patients with obesity, maybe like a, so the, like the classes, so class one is like that 30 to 34.9 class two, 35 to 39.9 class three people consider morbid obesity, which is the, the 40 BMI and, and over. And, uh, you know, I know some generally when they get to a 40 BMI and over they they may be metabolically healthy whereas there's nothing in their blood work at this moment, but a lot of them have sleep apnea and, and, a lot of other weight related issues, but, um, so yeah. joint degradation of the lower body. Yeah. So yeah. A lot of the, the, the fat mass or the weight related, not just the metabolic related issues. And, the, and so the thing is like, look, you know, I know vegans that seem to be super healthy that do, do some recreational drugs that, you know, maybe negate and, or maybe they don't sleep very well. They get like a few hours of sleep and it probably negates their super otherwise healthy lifestyle. Yeah. So yeah, you know, the people that uh, have metabolically unhealthy obesity and, and they're laughing about, you know, the otherwise very healthful individual who's uh, maybe doing a, a just mild cycles of anabolic steroids, probably pretty silly. Uh, and that's, that's why there is a lot of stigma. And the other thing is, I mean, I know Mike and I have very similar political views, but when you get into the whole, uh, you know, that idea of, of controlling yourself and, and not bothering other people, you know, is messing around with uh, some anabolic steroids as long as you're not harming others. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Why is that stigmatized more than people who use other recreational drugs? Uh, I, I don't know. It's a big stigma though. Um, so I understand. I, and I, I really think that, um, you know, my emphasis for making that post and just bringing up this conversation was 
just to kind of get it out there. I mean, how many things in the past used to be stigmatized, but as soon as you start talking about it, you know, people get educated, people learn. And um, I think it's just, I think it's more important not to even highlight the steroid steroids, but just to highlight the other lifestyle factors that nobody's really addressing the obesity, the, the drinking, the smoking, the things like that, that probably could. And, and I don't know this for sure, but I would think that would have more harm to you sooner than taking steroids in a controlled environment, right? Getting, getting regular checkups, getting regular blood work done. I would think that the effects from having these negative lifestyle factors, the overeating, the smoking, the drinking would probably do you in for lack of a better term, um, a lot sooner than doing a controlled anabolic cycle under, under, you know, medical supervision, getting blood work done, taking care of all other factors. Cause let's just use bodybuilders, for example, they're focusing on every other aspect of their health to the T, right? They're focused on their sleeping. They're focusing on their eating. They're, they're trying to keep their stress levels down. This is just one thing that they're doing. That's negative against their body, but they're doing it controlled. Whereas you've got people out there, regular individuals, general pop that are just not going to get blood work done, not going to see the doctor. They're going through McDonald's every day. They're smoking a pack of cigarettes. They're drinking a 12 pack every night. Those people I feel have more negative health consequences to worry about sooner than somebody that's taking controlled anabolics under medical supervision. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah. You know, I think it depends. I think you've got a lot of good points there, man. I think it depends a lot on the dose and duration of exposure to anabolics and the kind of anabolics. It has to be said, I think, that the attempt to control and do blood work, so blood work is always and everywhere a post hoc measurement. It only tells you how fucked up you got. <laughs> um, it doesn't really tell you how, uh, you know, if it's either good news or bad news and the news already happened. Um, and then what do you do after that is you probably take less stuff or don't take stuff for a while and let your body renorm and then try it again. Um, and people have different tolerance levels for what they think is good blood work. Um, some things blood work doesn't tell you like blood pressure, for example, that also needs to be checked. But I think that goes into the medical monitoring. And again, as a, how far are we willing to push it? Um, uh, somebody who, um, I respect greatly in this uh, endeavor is Broderick Chavez. Uh, and he's a coach of mine and as, as he coaches many other folks. And his job is really just to guide people in pharmaceutical use. Um, and what he says is unless you're, you should be healthy to be able to do the training and the dieting and take all the drugs of bodybuilding. And if you're not healthy, uh, that you're not in a good position to benefit mostly from all these things. So for him, he doesn't see it much as a health trade-off as health comes first. And then on top of that, you take what you need to take to get where you need to go. And as soon as there's a major impact on health, you have to reevaluate. And not everyone thinks like that. There's a huge incentive structure in bodybuilding to take as much gear as possible because you get the pro card, you get win your pro show or whatever, and supplement sponsors. And you know, let's be honest, ego, right? You people want to win. And if, and if winning stuff means just pulling a little bit more out of the vial and putting the same needle, same gauge, takes just as long to push or do your quad or glute or whatever, gee, it's, a, it's not that hard of a choice, you know? Like, yeah, it comes with side effects and you feel like shit, but like, yeah, cool stuff happens in the gym and then you're more bigger and more shredded and so on and so forth. So there's definitely a temptation to get on that upper end of things. And even if you have a controlled upper end, like you know what you're doing, you know the consequences, you can sort of look at the consequences and be like, oh, okay, that's, my blood pressure is like, 140 over 80, it used to be like 160 over 90, so this is good. I mean, 140 over 80 is not good. It's not something you want to have for a long time. You want to be lower than that, but some folks make these trade-offs. But the, the, the same thing exists in, in obesity. I would like to bring up something uh, related, however. I think that um, I, I'm skeptical on the idea about education, um, uh, in educating people about the health negatives of obesity and cigarette smoking and drinking, because I think almost everyone knows it's bad. Um, I think an, uh, maybe another approach is to figure out why people don't give a shit. Um, there's a giving a shit deficit about health, real big one. Spencer can tell you more than enough stories about him seeing patients and being like, this is what you're doing to kill yourself. And they're like, right on. And he's like, you understand this. They're like, uh-huh. And uh, 
you know, after that, there's just only so much that, uh, I, mean, I don't know, what do you do? I mean, we do have, thankfully, freedom uh, in, in this country, and nobody, you know, doctor would be like, lose weight. It doesn't, you know, it's, it's, it's very, I don't know, if you look at it from like an app perspective, that's very soft messaging. <laughs> We'd call in the app design industry, like, yeah, just, you know, if it comes up on your app, like, you should lose weight. You're like, ah, okay, no thanks. <laughs> just hit the no thanks. That's how most people treat their doctors. Maybe they should and maybe they shouldn't, but I think there's a big giving a shit deficit. And a lot of times uh, it's very politically incorrect to say that because then when people say like, oh, so you're saying some people care less about their health? <laughs> of course I'm fucking saying that. Yeah. Like, you know, Uncle Barry from Thanksgiving, he doesn't give a fuck about his health. He, he, some people are even beyond telling you they care about their health. Like some people legit, like no bullshit you. And this is actually some, somewhat easier for doctors in practice when they're like, I just don't care. And you're like, sweet. Well, a patient was notified, put in notes, type up notes. That's it. But sometimes maybe some of the worst is people are like, oh, I care. And then nothing in their lifestyle reflects that they care whatsoever because they don't actually care. But, you know, sociopolitically, they have to play the game and say, I care, of course, about my health. So I don't know. You guys have any ideas on, on, on the, or any controversy on that caring thing? I do. Spencer, what do you think? What do you guys think? It's Spencer. Yeah, no, it's, uh, that's uh, a, it, it's a big deal. Uh, and that's why, you know, we, we have these discussions about, about the Medicare for all and whether that will. I honestly don't. I think that will help some of these people who, who really do care and just can't afford to get their medicines or whatever. But I think there's so many people out there that just, they don't give a shit and just giving them insurance won't actually make them and make them healthier. So I do think there's a cultural societal issue here. And I think, you know, I think from, correct me if I'm wrong, David, but um, what you're saying is more education to the folks who are stigmatizing the idea of using hormone as opposed to the person using the hormone is you know what i'm saying so what what mike's saying is that people don't care about their health necessarily but what you're saying is there's just people even if they're healthy or not healthy they think those who are using the anabolics that's wrong right is that yeah that that's basically it. and i i think mike you brought up something really interesting that i i just throw the question out to you guys do you guys think that the people that don't give a shit, because I absolutely agree with you. I think there's, I think there's a huge issue with people just not giving a shit. Do you think those are the ones that just don't have enough education? Meaning, like, right. they don't give a shit because they don't know enough about it to give a shit. Like, they know it's bad, but they don't really know how bad. I, I, they, I uh, think. Go, uh, sorry. No, uh, go ahead. I, th I think it's, it's a combination. I think it's uh, out of sight, out of mind, right? Um, when, when we look at, uh, obesity and steroid use, uh, uh, obesity may be more forefront because you see the physical changes, right? But I mean, like someone injecting steroids into their ass or, uh, whatever type of uh, abuse they're doing, it's happening internally. They, they don't see it in front of their eyes. Right. And to, uh, Spencer's, uh, to Spencer's point here, which I, I know he's advocating and he's going through the process of doing right now. If people had more exposure to, um, you know, th their health, like the what you're trying to do right now, Spencer, is open up a private practice in a gym where it's something where, you know, you go into the gym and your primary care physician is right there. Right. D do you believe that? And I, I know some other people made fun of you because they're like, oh, back in the real world, you know, yeah. that's, that's not feasible. If we were to make something like that commonplace where their doctor was at the gym, where they could do full on physicals, they, they could have so much more hands-on interaction and so much more exposure in that constant reminder, right? Like a push notification going to their, their wristwatch of it. Instead of that, it's seeing their doctor a couple times a week, having to walk by the office. Would they care more in that situation just because maybe, uh, it makes them uh, more uh, cognitive of, of what they're doing. Well, here's what I think. I think there's going to be, so in the current situation, the current medical world, you go into your doctor, you just, it's so inefficient in an archaic system that like most doctors are burned out. You don't get that much time to discuss it. However, and, and those doctors that are burned out that don't even do the lifestyle encouragement, blah, 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 blah. There's about 10% of the patients who are missing out. So I, I think having that setup will help a lot more people, but it won't solve the issue. Like Mike's saying, 
there, even if, if, if we set it up and I still believe this is the right way to do it, but even if we set it up, which is what I'm going to do, it will only help those who actually do want the help. Uh, and that's probably going to be the minority of patients. That's, that's what I was going to bring up as soon as you got done saying that is that the people at the gym aren't the ones you need to be worrying about. Like for the most part, obviously people still go to the gym. They, they have health issues. They're trying to work it out, but you know, having the physician, I think that's a great idea. I, I think that'd be awesome what you're thinking about doing or, or going to do. Um, I just, I think that those aren't really necessarily the target people that you need to worry about educating. Those are people that whether or not they have health issues or not, they recognize the importance of being in a gym and, you know, trying to work through some of this. It's, it's educating the people that Mike was talking about, the ones that just don't give a shit. And that is a huge issue in this, in this country, uh, worldwide hell. Um, and you can't help someone that doesn't want to be helped. Right. We all know that. Yeah. Can, can, and, but I, I'm just curious as far as I would like to know, and obviously we don't have a study, we don't know how to figure this out. How many of those people that don't give a shit just really don't give a shit because they don't know enough to give a shit. Right. Because you brought up the socioeconomic, you know, point of view, like, maybe a lot of them came from very, very poor neighborhoods. They didn't have the education to begin with. So they don't even know. They don't even so, know about it. Uh, yeah. I'm aware of some of that literature oh, yeah. and it, it turns out you have to have almost no education at all to know uh, what is basically a healthy food and what's basically not. Uh, they've administered various re research questionnaires to a bunch of folks, different education backgrounds, various degrees of intelligence, uh, economics, so on and so forth. And uh, almost everyone can tell you that an apple is good for you and a cheeseburger is not. Um, almost, uh, you know, children of a very young age can point to a broccoli and chicken meal and a meal of entirely candy and tell you which one's more healthy. Now they'll get cheeky about it and say it's the candy one. I'm like, all right, Billy, what do you really think? I'm like, I'm drinking broccoli, right? So first of all, second of all, there are uh, uh, obesity stigmas, uh, almost uh, you know, probably a cu cultural universal in humans. To some extent or another, all human subpopulations stigmatize obesity, and almost almost nobody who is over fat actually wants to be over fat. All right, so there's not this like total innocence, uh, and oh, that only education can fix. Of like, I had no idea eating cheeseburgers was bad. I had no idea drinking myself into stupidity was terrible. I had no idea I was out of shape, even though I weighed 300 pounds. Almost all of these people have some semblance of an idea. I think one of the problems with education is that precisely the people that don't give a shit don't give a shit to get educated. So when you say like education will fix it, how do you deliver education to someone who doesn't care? You could ask the public school system that they don't have any answers. There's a bunch of kids that don't care about learning geometry or physics or anything. And they'll just sit in the classroom like this and they won't learn anything. And they'll just fail out. And this isn't even compulsory. Like education, you have to go to school. Otherwise you get in trouble. In adult education in the United States is like some people just have terrible health habits. They don't care to get educated. And I think was what I mentioned earlier is if you educate them about how bad the stuff they're doing to themselves really is, it's going to be more of a confirmation of what they already knew and a kind of bludgeoning on the head to do something about it rather than totally novel. Is that the percent, if you get a hundred people in an adult education class and tell them, look, is it probably eat fewer cheeseburgers and eat more chicken breast and broccoli. There's going to be like almost no, maybe one person is going to be like, oh, what? <laughs> They're just going to be like, uh, uh, I know, I know I have to lose weight. Like it, it's, um, it's definitely, it's definitely a thing. I'm not even so much naive enough to think that we're going to change the adult population, especially the older adult population. I'm looking more towards educating the youth from this point on because there's Whoa, no Michael Jackson. I'm totally kidding. That was, that was super fucked up to say. <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's, you know, there's very little health education in schools nowadays uh, compared to even, I, I'm 35, even compared to when I was in elementary school, I, I think we had health classes. I think we had like home ec classes where they taught you how to cook. They taught you how to do this stuff. But I think as far as the, and maybe education wasn't the right word to use for the adult population, but we need to get more psychological help, I guess, for lack of a better term, we need to, we need to figure out, get them help figure out why they keep overeating, why they keep smoking and drinking and why they don't give a shit. It's not, yeah. I get you, Mike. Like, I agree with you. Like, yeah, you put a chicken and broccoli on a plate, a fucking dog knows that that's going to be healthy. Sure. 
But, what, if, what if the answer to that question that you just asked is like brutally simple for a, for a, a huge majority of people? Like, why do they eat burgers and shit? Because they fucking taste good. Why do they smoke cigarettes? Because cigarette smoking makes you feel great. Why do they drink? Because it makes you feel good. Like, what do you say to that? Like, you, but it's bad for you long term. What if they legitimately don't give a shit about the long term? Like, a lot of people, their time, their time horizon for thinking is, is tiny. Right? Well, um, as far as just, you know, when they say, oh, it tastes good, it feels good, say, well, why are you needing to fill that void? Like, what do you else do you need to feel good? But as far as the people that just don't give a shit, that are never going to give a shit, I mean, you got to kind of have to wash your hands with those people. I, you, There's a lot of people, man. <laughs> I don't, I think that, I think that if more people were willing, because tell me if you disagree, like majority of people probably overeat to drown out some feelings, right? I don't know if that's true. I, I would I, say, I, I think they're filling a void and, and I'm coming from that from the other end of the spectrum as far as when I battled my eating disorder years ago, like I, I was in the hospital, I was in the ICU for a month. I nearly lost my life. And I was filling that void of fear and everything by over-exercising, by not eating. Whereas these other people are probably filling, filling some sort of psychological need that they're not getting through overeating or through drinking or self-medicating some, some sort, you know? Before I let Spencer chime in and actually uh, he's a guy that knows this stuff. I think the folks that are in the five to 600 pound range, almost all of them have feeling a void in some sense or another. I think a lot of people in the two and three hundreds are just like folks that, you know, I come home, I'm tired from work, fucking t cake tastes good. You know, people get happy, all kinds of things. They get happy in engaging in sexual relations with each other. They get happy watching Netflix documentaries and they get happy eating tasty food. I sure tasty foods a part of my equation, you know, and I, I, I don't know if I'm filling a void. I guess maybe we're all filling a void at some point. Like it doesn't really matter what what you say you're doing, you could be filling a void. Like, well, I have a yoga practice that really like fucking gets my chakras going. You're like, you're just filling a void. Like, all right. Well, I guess there's no right answer to that. Right. But I think a lot of people are, do have what you describe as severe emotional problem, high level of anxiety that they're using food as a coping mechanism. But I don't know if that's the majority of the overweight population. Spencer, can you speak to that at all? I think maybe, maybe a lot of them are just people who just make sort of shitty choices. They kind of know the shit. They kind of don't give a shit. They kind of just keep making them. That's my suspicion. Yeah, I've been trying to fill your void for a long time now, but uh, <laughs> I lost money, baby. I'm out of your league. That's what I tell you when before you. Yeah, so you yeah, the obesity is pretty complex, but in, in general, you know, we're surrounded by we're in an obesogenic uh, environment, and you know, our genetics are a certain way. The environment kind of pulls the trigger. Uh, genetics load the gun. Environment pulls the trigger. So I, I think, in general, what, what Mike said is, is true. There there are some individuals with. Um, you know, severe obesity, uh, like very big emotional uh, holes, and they're using food to, to medicate. But the, the majority of this mildly overweight to obesity epidemic is probably stems from our environment. Uh, and that's why it's likely a public health issue that we have to, I don't know how, but somehow get people to eat fewer of these highly tasty foods that make us taste good for that fleeting moment. Uh, and, and who have a short timeline, as Mike said. Um, yeah, I have a hypothesis on how that's going to happen. By the way, if anyone, all right, let's hear it. Shit out. What is it? Oh no, is that okay? Can I share it? Yeah, absolutely. Go for it, bud. <laughs> I say some like some super crazy politically incorrect oh, shit. Dude, it's it's okay. I, I I think it makes the podcast better to get famous uh... last words. <laughs> um, I honestly think that in the next twenty years, uh, depending on how regulatory bodies treat this. I honestly think that we're going to see a, a almost solution to the obesity epidemic uh, in the realm of genetic engineering or highly specific designer drugs. Um, we have yet to see uh, large scale testing and although the testing has now begun, I think, um, which they know for a fact it's begun as our colleagues conducting it on uh, leptin agonists. Um, and like, if your leptin levels are high enough, you won't eat. It's just, you would have to be fighting every urge not to eat to stuff yourself. Like think about how you feel at the top end of a bulking phase and there's another plate of chicken and rice staring at you and you're just like, well, like if your leptin levels get high enough, that's how you feel. If your ghrelin levels get low enough, that's how you feel at baseline. If we have a reliable orally administrable leptin agonist 
or from a genetic engineering perspective, simply jack up your own leptin production. Gee, you know, and there's about 50 other modulators you could use all the way to neural modulation that if you got that right, gee, you know, man, you just, the overeating would be a confusing thing. Now, I think Spencer has told me some stories uh, of folks that have all the most powerful drugs available today, and they're pretty powerful already, anti-obesity drugs. If you take them as prescribed, there's really no drive to eat whatsoever, and you sort of have to remember to eat. Um, they're not as powerful as leptin agonists, so on and so forth, but they're close. Uh, he, sometimes there's still a stories of people just being like, nah, I gained five pounds. And he's like, why? They're like, I, I haven't been taking my drugs. He's like, why? They're like, nah. <laughs> like, what to do with those people? I have no idea. And I honestly think society may never solve that problem. Yeah. Well, so yeah, some of these, some of these people with, uh, you know, genetic, like hyperlipidemia, they're, they're trying to find ways to go in and crisper them. I don't know what they're doing. Some crazy genetic modification to where the, uh, in this, like, like you said, the ethics, I don't know, but, they're going in and that's going to be the, I think that's going to be the new thing where eventually it's not even taking drugs. It's just, they go in their genetics. I don't know. It's, this is some crazy. Yeah, gap yeah no, stuff. it's uh, there's, I actually took down some notes before coming in. Cause I, I, that was one of the things I wanted to be able to, to speak to if somebody brought it up and there's uh, a couple things. One, I know, oh man, it, it actually eludes me right now. It's a special type of sugar and sweetness medication that uh, when you drink it completely takes away uh, the satisfaction and makes uh, sweet things taste like uh, like sour or it completely neutralizes flavor. And I oh, know that was like it uh, I, I forget what it is. But I was watching a, a video of it the other day. And like they were, they were putting like Sour Patch Kids in front of people and cake and like all these super high palatable foods. But because they made them uh, drink uh, this this remedy that that neutralizes sugar, all the people were taking one bite and were like, "This tastes like dirt." Like physically, I'm looking at this and I want to eat it, but I cannot stand to actually put it into my stomach because it tastes that bad. The, the, the other, uh, one, one of the other drugs I'm aware of designer drugs is called SR 9009 being developed Whoa. by script research Institute. <laughs> yeah, it's over 9,000, right? It'll Your DBZ you reference, Android, which is fucking sweet. <laughs> but in, in lab, uh, in animal testing, what they've shown so far is, uh, keeping keeping the the animals and, and the rats sedentary they actually found without any sort of st uh, exercise stimulus the rats were losing uh, body fat gaining uh, lean muscle mass and uh, however there's there's a big drawback here uh, when they actually put the rats into uh, exercise they had to stop uh, they physically had to stop them because uh, they just kept going they just kept going to the point of, uh, of exhaust uh, of exhaustion uh, but that is currently being uh, developed to treat obesity, uh, type two diabetes, uh, different uh, different types of uh, cholesterol, and improve uh, gluten uh, metabolism. Um, Did you say gluten? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like the, poison. Uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, and the, the the last one is I know twenty three and Me is uh, they have the first designer patent in the U.S. for um, like you said, like uh, CRISPR uh, modifications to DNA to, I mean, it's it's almost like uh, a role playing game where you have the attributes and uh, n not that they, they have it fully function, but at least they have the patent for it where uh, making designer babies. And again, like you may think I'm crazy for saying this stuff, but literally like <laughs> drop down like uh, eye color, hair color, like relative height. Do you want them to be more? Uh, so if I wanted like a six foot six black baby, they could <laughs> It, it's NBA star. Your name is NBA star. <laughs> but I, I know those those are uh, three current things going on with, uh, if you would like, uh, designer drugs or yeah, genetic so, modification. So when it comes to ob, oh, you know, obesity treatment. You know, I, I go to the, I get all the alerts and things in my email box. I go to the, I literally just saw uh, a lecture from someone who's developing a, a, a basically a myostatin inhibitor. And they're using it for obesity and type 2 diabetes and it's, it was really interesting because usually a lot of these medicines as mike was talking about they have an anorectic effect they work on appetite but this medicine called demagramab basically down the down the line 
inhibits myostatin, people were gaining considerable amounts. These are patients with obesity and type 2 diabetes, considerable amounts of fat-free uh, mass from muscle and losing body fat and their blood sugars were improving simply from a completely different mechanism. So the idea the muscle just gobbles all of it up, right? Yeah. So, yeah. So yeah, you make, you make more, uh, area to, um, to soak up. Yeah. Like you said, glucose and, and hopefully decrease that metabolically unhealthy adipose, uh, uh, and also maybe make them more capable of moving in better in certain like certain instances. But yeah, the idea of obesity as a disease, what you said, they're, they're finding all sorts of receptors all over the place to try to basically shut down appetite and find different mechanisms to maybe increase metabolic rate and fat free muscle, uh, muscle mass, fat free mass. And so, you know, I don't think education, uh, it's a, it's a great concept, but, you know, just knowing, you know, the literature is out there, but even knowing my patients, you, you could give them everything. Um, uh, you can give them the best insurance. You can give them access to the gym. You can give them access to the best coaches out there. There's just so many people and you can tell them the whole timeline of how they're going to develop their disease and what's going to happen. And they're just don't give a shit. And, you know, um, I think, but there are, there is a small percentage of the people out there that they don't have the means to do it. They don't know how to do it. And those are the people that really were there for to help who, you know, we're here for them once they decide. And you can do all sorts of motivational interviewing and, and all these different things when you're in the clinic. But ultimately, there's going to be most people just aren't going to give a shit, uh, despite blue in the face education. But um, yeah. I, I will say that. Uh, sorry, Spencer, I didn't mean to cut you off. Yeah. No, go or alternatively, I meant to cut you off, and this means war. <laughs> so um, I think, uh, Dave, there may not be a potential huge beneficial role for educating people on the downsides of obesity and cigarette smoking and drinking, because I think they're pretty saturated. The ones that are going to give a shit already do. Yeah. I think there's a huge, huge, huge potential uh, – benefit for educating people about okay you don't want to be a piece of shit anymore what do you do because it's a very different thing to know that you're not um uh you know on the right path you guys hear me so far yeah okay um it's very different thing to know that you're not on the right path versus knowing which path to be on and i don't mean like it's like healthy eating is not a fucking path it's an idea and you could you could tell someone, okay, eat healthy now. And they're like, uh, and there's like the 50 Joe Rogan interviews about the different kind of diet gurus he's had on going through their head at the same time. Dr. Oz, who could, if he went through no more heads would be great. Um, and a bunch of different shit going on. And at the end of the day, they're like, uh, macros. It's like, you know, it's like a good test for if you've made artificial intelligence, you give it all the information about data and you're like, what does it say? It goes macros, right? Gets broken. Just shut it down. We need to rebuild this shit. Right. You, actual good healthy eating habits and good exercise habits uh, conveyed simply and eloquently and in a way that can onboard people to doing them for the long term, that's a big challenge. And I think there's a lot to say about that. Um, because if you get people to this place where you're like, you're a piece of shit, your life sucks. They're like, yep, I got it. I want to do something. And you go, we'll do something about it. These are the, the typical, I think the Knox Spencer might have on some doctors is, uh, you know, patients come to them and they're like, oh, you know, I'm in bad, bad shape. Like doctors like, yeah, I know you should Eat, eat, move more and eat less. They're like, okay, that's it. Like, is there any strategies by which I could do that? Like, like, do I walk double the the length to work? Do I just have the same slice of pizza but cut it off with scissors to three quarters? It's a dog shit strategy to lose, but it's just not sustainable, right? Because the palatability issues, lifestyle issues. Like, there's a huge conversation to be had, a lot of work to do about saying, okay, you're a piece of shit. You know, you're a piece of shit health wise. What are we gonna do? How are you gonna get these? steps on the, on the, on the staircase to get yourself to a better place sustainably with actual results. Um, because there's, you know, knowing you're doing the bad thing doesn't mean you know how to do the good thing very well. And in a way that lasts. I think, I think what I'm gathering from this great conversation is that, um, educating might've been the wrong word to use because I agree with all you like, 
everybody that's doing this stupid shit to their health, they know, they know better. Right. I think more so is emphasizing what to do from here. Right. You've already gotten to this point. Listen, you know what to do. So providing a better guidance, a better, sure. and I guess educating them in that sense, like, listen, okay, you're already here. You, you know, this is shitty. This is how, this is a, a reasonable, sustainable way to kind of start correcting this. Right. And then that breeds down to generations after them. And we start educating more in the schools, kids nowadays, they start growing up over the next 20, 30 years. They're the ones that are going to decrease the obes obesity rate in this country. The obese people are already going to die off in 20 years, right? So it's the new generation that's going to lower the obesity rates. We can't, to think that we're going to lower it with people that are 50 and older, 50 or 60 and older right now is probably pretty slim, right? It's probably, probably pretty naive to think. Pretty slim, huh? That's an interesting choice of words. No pun intended. <laughs> but I think that educating them on, okay, this is where you're at right now this is what you need to do if you want to have any sort of longevity from this point on and then educating younger people and just going back to the whole steroids thing. I mean, I just use that as an avenue to kind of bring up this discussion and everything, but starting to talk about things. I think that it's pretty clear that most issues that occur with whatever you're looking at job relationships, school, you know, the community, whatever, it comes from communication, a lack of communication, right? People get false information out there. It sends people into a, you know, hysteria and people just become dumb. They just, they just don't understand what to believe. And I think having conversations, having difficult conversations, bringing up, you know, taboo topics like steroids and actually talking about the facts, not trying to sway people one way or the other, bringing up obesity, bringing up smoking and not really trying to belitter these belittle these people that already are there, but trying to be like, listen, you're here. This is what you need to do. If you want to have any chance to, you know, have any longevity. And if you don't, if you're one of those people that Mike says, don't give a shit, which we all know are going to be a good handful of them, then fine. But don't say that we didn't try to get the information out there, try to help you, you know, go down a different path. That's, I think that a lack of communication is the big issue in most health related, you know, topics nowadays is, I mean, you see it with, you see it with keto, you see it with paleo, you see it with, you know, vegan, vegans, um, vegetarians, um, people are just putting out information and screwing everybody up and we just need to do a better job, um, as a whole of educating people and giving them better alternatives, I guess, to follow. I completely agree. You should see the comments on my, uh, I did a TEDx talk about healthy eating. Uh, yeah. In a parallel to book that we have at RP called Understanding Healthy Eating. What a sexy exotic title. <laughs> and uh, the time comments, time. yeah, the YouTube comments in the talk are unbelievable. Like it's, it, it would say shock me, but it's just highly entertaining. There's like half the comments are like, oh, this is great. And then the other half the comments are split pretty much 50-50 into carnivore people versus the vegans and they, like they're like oh yeah this guy doesn't know shit because uh one guy literally said whole grains question mark what an idiot and i was like man whole grains are healthy what controversy how could i and then another person's like yeah this video is stupid <clears throat> everyone knows plant-based diet is the way to get healthy in the story and i'm like wow like that is helping because you know how many people bounce around to this kind of shit. Like, oh, absolutely. So I, I got actually I got a question. I do uh, Instagram Q and A's occasionally throughout the week. I got a question the other day asking me if butter was a carb. To me, oh that's God. true. Okay. I was like, I failed. Like, if these people are following me and they don't know that butter is not a carb, I'm doing that something. Sucks, man, I yeah, need. That sucks. I thought that was from Mean Girls. I, I seriously, it took me a little while to just. I had to kind of collect myself before I answered it because I have, I have a very similar personality and smart ass comment. Like you do, Mike, like I just didn't really want to go off this guy. And I was like, I don't remember what I said to him, but I had to collect myself for a little bit. But I'm like, if people are still asking if butter is a carb, there needs to be some more education out there. Sure. Yeah. 
they might have been trolling you from the Mean Girls movie. That's a quote from Mean Girls. Is it? Uh, really? You know, you know Spencer, fifty percent. I, I think maybe yes, and fifty percent. I think those people really do exist, man. Still, not not oh, ironically. Yeah, of course they do. <laughs> Everybody keeps saying loose. How can I loose fat instead oh, of Oh, that's loose great. Fat. That's my Spencer. Favorite. I don't. I don't think I'm got enough following on Instagram to uh, be trolled yet. So. <laughs> Instagram, dude. I, the, I think I need a few thousand more followers before I get those trolls starting to come after me. The, the 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 comments can absolutely be mind blowing sometimes. Like even when the information is good, like I know the one comment that you got Spencer the other day where the girl was like, Oh, you know, sucks to you. You haven't put out anything new. So what you're saying is worthless. Like what does that say about the mentality of the people that we're, we're preaching to that they're like, you know what, this is all great information, but I don't care what you have to say because it's not new. Yeah. I mean, that's that, fucking that, crazy. That's part of the problem. So yeah, Mike, I don't know. You, you, you repost my memes and don't never give me credit. So you don't clearly, you're not following me on. I love the watermarks you put on your memes. Wait, you don't. I don't, I don't because you know what? It's a gift. It's like, I am a generous guy. I go, so am I. <laughs> the you don't need Lord. recognition that. I know, I don't. I just don't think you're because you're literally my boss. So, uh, no, but um, yeah, I, I, I think there are so many people, like, yeah, this person, they literally, I say the same things over. I could, I could come up with like a list of like probably 20 things I just repeat and probably a list of like five things I repeat even more often. Cause there's always new people coming to watch your stuff and they yeah. need to hear this stuff. And I say it in different ways for the old followers in the same way. And, but, but with a different meme for the, for, um, for the, for the new followers. So they, they, it's infotainment, but like someone was like, all you talk about is a calorie deficit. You never talk any, about anything new. Maybe a body type diet would work. It, it's good to individualize. I go, yeah, but you're not. And I said, well, why don't you just use a Zodiac sign to, to, to give a diet to individualize. And they're like, now you're just, now you're just being a bully. You're like Fox news. You, you never say anything new. You're an idiot. I'm just like, Oh my God. Like I'm saying there's no evidence to use. A, there's not any evidence biologically plausibility for using a body type type of diet, the way these other people are using. So why not just use your hair color or whatever? And she just, I mean, she just basically said, I don't say anything new. And I'm like, that's because our basic, scientific principles of weight loss and fat loss have not changed. We have some, like you said, we're going to come up with some new drugs. That's what, that's all we got. We got drugs and maybe public policy to potentially change our environment and the way we're educated and blah, 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 blah. But like the basic principles have not, will not change unless we get a freaking CRISPR making genetic babies who somehow burn way more calories than they're supposed to and eat a lot less than they're supposed to. People that new thing to admit to themselves that they're overcomplicating nutrition and training. They don't want it. They don't want it because we live in a society where we get everything so instantly nowadays. They're yeah, always yeah. looking for something new and they calorie deficit. You want to lose fat calorie deficit, right? That's not sexy to them. Nobody wants to admit that. Nobody wants to admit you want, you want, you want hypertrophy progressively overload, right? That sucks. That's hard. It's <laughs> oh, like, that's a, you mean like it's going to take more than a month. Yeah, like, and it's harder every week. You said you know, progressive overload. I don't want to be part of that. You know, fat loss, muscle growth to be like Amazon Prime. They want it sure. over. And it, it, you're never going to be able to, you know, you're never going to be able to satisfy those people. And I mean, I think that you have to find a new way to just keep saying the same thing in a new, in a new light. And I think that's what we all do. I think we all just kind of recycle the same information. We just find a new way to say it, but it's the same information. It's, it's the same concept behind most things because you break it down. Nutrition is not complicated, not as complicated as what we want to make it to be. Training is not as complicated as what we want to make it to be or what people want to make it to be. So you're always going to have those people that reach out to you. They're like, Oh, you're boring. Like, why don't you say something new? Well, what do you want me to make up something like you want me to make up something and screw you over even more? Like, That's what you, I said. I was like, you want me to make up some bullshit? I can, I can make up some bullshit about using some weird body hair type of diet based on your DHT levels and all sorts of shit. I can make up some, I could, I know so much shit that I could make up some crazy stuff that people would love, but you know, it would be unethical. That's what they want. So, yeah. it's, uh, so it's interesting too. People will say, that like, oh, you know, this, they've been preaching this and it hasn't worked. 
not bothering to check whether or not actually anyone has tried it. So one of the things they'll say like, well, back in the eighties and nineties, they told us to eat a bunch of grains and we all got fat. And they're like, okay, were people eating any less fat? And while they were eating more carbohydrate, they're like, look at the data. No, they just added carbohydrate on top of fat. Like, okay. So the whole, cause people say like, oh, the low fat, high carb thing never worked. Like who the fuck did low carb, high fat? Uh, or sorry, low, 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 uh, low fat, high carb. Who did that? And they're like, well, that's what the government told people to do. I'm like, do people listen to what the government says usually? They're like, well, no. And so the food, the original food guide pyramid gets a lot of a shit. And then lo and behold, no one ever fucking did it. And if, if you actually follow what it, what it said, you'd probably be in very good shape. So it's, it's funny that that kind of stuff comes from, from all sides sort of when you say, Oh, like I need new stuff. And you're like, why? Like, Cause the old stuff didn't work. But like, who tried the old stuff? Like, well, everyone did. Like, no, no one did. The answer is almost no one. And the people that tried it, they're like, you know, your boss that's a marathon runner has been in shape since 1972. So he's like, oh, I just eat mostly whole grains and a bit of meat. And you're like, God damn it. Why does everything work on you? Because he fucking does actual stuff that you're supposed to do. Um, and so people keep looking for these novelties when they don't do anything that is actually being told to them. And there's a bunch of, man, you guys got me ranting now. I fucking hate the shit. People just bounce back and forth between bullshit fads. I used to say this thing on podcasts a while ago. It's still true. Can you imagine what it's like to be that person that did Atkins in the early 2000s. They did all the avocados and olive oil in the mid 2000s. They loved bacon and whole eggs in the late 2000s. In the early 2000s, they did, you know, intermittent fasting. And then now they're doing keto and they're doing, you know, daily intermittent fasting now and they're doing water fasts. And you look back and you're in the same bullshit shape you were since 2000. And someone's like, hey, have you tried this diet? You're like, I can fucking tried all of them. And, and I, can't, I can't believe I fell for every single piece of bullshit that ever came out. So when, when people ask, people ask myself and Spencer and uh, I'm sure Dave and you guys all the time, hey, like, what do you think of this new thing? My first answer is I don't think about new things. I think about time-tested things. And then once you're doing them and they're having great effect, you can experiment with a new thing every now and again where it has some theoretical rationale behind it. And then they're like, oh, so this new thing doesn't work? And I'm like, oh, my God, it might. But why don't you do the real shit that works first? And then you can pepper in some intermittent fasting on top to see if that fits your lifestyle and doesn't fuck over everything else. But people want that new thing all the time because it's very appealing. It's very human nature to think, oh, this is new. It's great. Unfortunately, with exercise and science uh, and, and training and, and diet, it, it's almost backwards. It's the tried and true you should be looking for. The tried and true you have to do, though. So, you know, so well, Consistency and patience, two things that most people are lacking. Sure. So. Absolutely. While while I have all three of you guys here, this is uh, this is something that I, I think about on on a regular basis, and it really goes to your point, Mike, about people always falling into the new fad or, or whatever it is. And one, I, I think it points out how desperate people are, right? That they're maybe willing to buy into things that they otherwise wouldn't if they were in better shape. But it's it's like uh, V shreds, right? Like he he made like one point five million dollars on Instagram last year peddling uh blood type diets body type diets and all sorts of shit like that and then like he's always coming out with the, the brand new secret whatever blah 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 and and people eat that shit up and it's it's so unfortunate that people like yourself don't get those seven million followers because you're you're bringing the the actual information to the masses and they just scoff at that and they turn away because it's not <laughs> sexy or it's not appealing and how, how do you combat that? Like myself as a much smaller account with, you know, just a couple thousand followers at this point, I find myself and I always feel kind of odd about it, uh, making clickbaity uh, titles and screens uh, where because someone needs that, like whatever that pizzazz to, to get them to click on something and then presenting them with uh, with the actual true information. But like it. Is, is that the way to do it is to just like kind of uh, manipulate people into clicking on your stuff? Like how, how do you combat, you know, uh, Instagram and uh, all these people like, uh, like Dr. Yeah. Oz, who every week is my celery juice, thyroid curing um, blueberries. Like, like how, how do you combat something like that? That was actually my answer. Blueberries. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I think that uh, there's a sort of, uh, two rules we use in RP marketing, maybe three, are first, don't ever lie. We're never going to tell you anything in an ad that is not actually true. Like, get in your best shape. True, we can get you there. Okay, it doesn't say you're not going to have to work. 
we actually have ads that say, are you ready to work? And people don't click on them until they're like, God damn it. Okay. Click. <laughs> sure. I'm ready to work. This sucks. And then it shows you this workout program. I'm like, fuck, all right, I'll buy it. This asshole. I guess I get cheap. So first of all, don't ever, don't ever lie. So people say, say they, they feel sleazy when they do marketing. Uh, sure. But if you're saying nothing that's factually incorrect, there's only so sleazy you can feel, right? Where if you actually start lying to people, you're going to fucking, because, you know, like that whatever guy, V shreds or whatever, it's, half the shit is straight up lies. That's not oh, true. Yeah. That's false. That's an exaggeration. So don't lie. And second, put things into a really good light that just concords with just normal marketing principles that don't have stupid text that just all the same hire a digital illustrator to make your shit look cool. There's nothing wrong with making your shit look cool. Um, and, and then and, and sort of rule number three for us is trump up the parts of our plan that are competitive advantages. For example, at RP, the guy in charge of coaching is Spencer Nadolsky. He's a fucking medical doctor, a specialist in obesity, a high-level athlete himself, and he knows a ton of shit. Who the fuck runs your program? Some some cocksucker with no college degree who's just the who's, who's past whose past fucking accomplishment included the scamming of people out of something in another industry. Like you know, people. He, uh, I'm gonna talk fucking. I'll talk shit. Um, there's uh, there's a gentleman on uh, social media named Athlean X. Oh yeah. Uh, like I mean, you know, maybe he's got good shit. But like some guy asked me what I think about Athlean X, and I'm like. So his name is, an, uh, is a conglomerate of three separate things. One, some kind of athletes, which is good. You want to be an athlete. Those guys get a lot of pussy, I guess. Uh, two, you lean because you want to be shredded because hoes love that shit too. And also X, which means like extreme or X factor. Like they just don't know about you. The government snipers like, should I take the shot? The guy's like, I don't know, X factor. And you're like, I don't know. Is that really him or is it a fucking hologram? So it's like the three most marketiest, bullshittiest thing you could put together into one fucking person. Maybe the guy knows his shit and he's very successful and I wish him the best. But like if, if you're looking at shit and you see Athlean X, like if you're a person who's been through a bunch of different diets and you're reasonably, reasonably intelligent, you're going to look at that and be like, this just sounds like bullshit, <laughs> you know, versus if you see some other shit, one of you guys puts out an Instagram thing like, hey, science results delivered. Click here. You're like, yeah, science seems pretty reputable and results that seems pretty straightforward there's nothing else going on here that warns me of hype you know hype can be an anti-advertisement to a lot of the people you want to appeal to because let's be honest who do you want to sell stuff to reasonably intelligent people that just god damn it want something to work if you want to sell stuff to people that think like clown faces help you sell shit maybe you don't want those people as repeat customers because they're not going to be repeat customers they'll bury you the next fad you'll make a million dollars this year next year you'll make two hundred thousand the year after you'll file for bankruptcy because your fad came and went um, if you want something that's not a fad, talk about tried and true and tested. Like if you see a Mercedes commercial, what does it look like? It's mostly the car and people being like, look how fucking sweet this car is. You're like, fuck, I want it. I want that car. There's no extra colors. The car's not fucking hot pink and has a bow on it. No crazy shit. It's just, this is quality. This is a product that's been around for fucking a hundred plus years. It's fucking good. So if you advertise with never lie, present your product to the best possible way that doesn't lie and also talk about the science, the backbone, the data, the consistency, the, I really want to help you. you got a fucking great formula. Is it going to get everyone? Of course they're going to get everyone, but you know, marketing that gets everyone is a very mythical thing to begin with. And as soon as you do a real good job and make lots of money, getting a lot of people, you can always fudge your marketing a little bit to try to get this area, this there area, that area. But I think generally those core concepts probably help. I don't know, Spencer, did I just fuck up our whole advertising model? No, no, no. So, so, okay. I, I, I want to give everybody a story. So I followed what you originally said always. And I hired a marketer a couple of years ago and basically said, look, you gotta, you gotta hype things up. You gotta do, you gotta tell people what they want to hear and then give them what they need. That's what all they said. And I said, you know what? I'm not a marketer. I'm going to entrust, trust that you know what you're doing. Cause I'm not, I, I wasn't a marketer at the time. I've done a lot of courses, done a lot of conferences since then. And what happened was we promised an extreme amount of weight loss because people that are 300, 400 pounds on a low calorie diet are going to lose like 30 pounds in a month. If you, if you do it right. Um, however, there were people that were on the leaner end that were pissed when they lost only five to 10 pounds in one month, which is extremely good. And despite like all the education afterwards, we, it was very hyped to get people to, you're going to lose rapid weight this first month. My whole idea was kind of a low calorie diet to then transition them into a, um, into a reasonable lifestyle to, to really get that rapid weight loss first. And then 
do it correctly a- afterwards and, and transition correctly. I'll tell you what, the hype, the hype actually backfired on me. People were like, "This isn't, this isn't you, Doctor Spencer. You're, you are more reasonable." You know, they think it's similar to RP. Like, it doesn't work. And I think you guys have had in the past similar type of uh, backlash from emails and stuff. So, what's interesting? So I'm also working with the the marketing with RP. And Nick and we, we we hired these new marketers to help with some of the copywriting because we're going to be launching these hypothyroid templates out, and you, and it's funny because you get this first copy back of the copywriting that they write the sales page of. You got to moderate the fuck out of it. And it was like, no, no, no! What the fuck are you talking about? We're not going to boost your slow <clears throat> metabolism with this crazy new diet. It, I mean, I wish I wish we could actually do screenshots and show how it's turned from. It was ridiculous, and I, I mean, like, I was a bit annoyed at first. Into it's reasonable now, but I, it's also because I've gone through this myself, and I know what works. You lean on our credentials. You lean on our past success. RP, like you said, how do you how do you combat these people? RPs had, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of success stories, and and all these, you know, pictures worth a thousand word transformation pictures. Uh, and and you you lean on the past success, you lean on the science, you lean on the credentials. You do not lie. You build a, a, a company for success like RP has done, and uh, and and they will be. Uh, uh, we're going to be along. We're going to be around lo- a lot longer than people than V shreds. Um, I think because I mean maybe yeah sure he could keep changing his his spin on things. And you meet keep making a new thing to do new people. If he can uh, sleep so, at night. Yeah, exactly. It's like, but you know, having your scruples and integrity is important. And I think that's the way you can bet. I mean, you know, I, I, what I have a hundred and I don't know, 70. Whoa, big man. Yeah. Big man. (laughs) I don't have millions, but you know, I'm telling you, people are going to be sick of following the bullshit. And that's what I'm finding is our niche is people are fine. They're going, you know, I'm sick of spinning my wheels. I'm sick of doing the keto, whatever crazy diet for the past 20 years. I want to finally do what's right. And that's what we're seeing. These people are going, I want to do it right. Just now tell me what to do. That's real based on science. And if you stick to the, your guns, it's slow, just like progressive overload and dieting. But in the end, I think that will win out uh, eventually, at least for, from a business standpoint. I, I think like it's, it's pretty easy to do the RP thing because we have such a track record now and we can lean on stuff and we have a bunch of PhDs and shit like that. I think that advice for folks uh, with a couple hundred Instagram followers, maybe even fewer, or a couple thousand, is uh, you don't even need to lean on your past or whatever. You can be one of those gems in in a bunch of, in a pile of rocks that sort of stops this crazy ad stream in people's faces of new hype diet, you with a bigger dick or whatever. Maybe not dick pills, we don't make that yet. But, you know, like, crazy results, super transformations, tons of promises. And it's a bunch of noise people hear all the time. And they've tried some of these things and they've just the same, they burnt out. You could be that one person that quiets the conversation and just goes, Hey, um, I can give you results that you're going to have to work hard. And they're like, okay, so what's your catch? What's your thing? Like people have literally asked us what our thing was. And this was back when we didn't have a thing. We're like, you know, it's just basic logic and science. We tell you what to do. You do it. If you do a good job, it works. And they're like, what else? Like we literally have nothing else. And there's other people out there that will tell you they have the super fancy formula. We're here to tell you that fancy formula doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter if you have 10 Instagram followers. You work with one client. You do a good job. They tell every fucking person at their office like, yo, John hooked me up. You want to lose weight this Christmas? You fucking hit him up. He's my my friend. He, he, because you know, they lose 20 pounds at the office, and everybody else is like, Yo, Janice, what is going on? What is what are you doing? And they'll say, Well, that's my friend John, he's a personal trainer on Instagram, he can write you a plan. They're going to be like, Wow, this is great. And then they talk to John, and it's something they've never heard in their lives, right? It's like a bunch of bullshit they've heard. This is going to be easy, this is going to be fun, this is going to be fast. And he's like, It's not going to be easy, it's not going to be fun, it's not going to be fast, it's going to work though. Are you ready to enter? into the real world and get actual real results for the first time. And they're like, Oh fuck. Um, yeah, I guess. Right. And then they get success and so on and so on and so on. And then you have like an RP type brand where you actually get people in shape and your only tagline is you actually get people in shape. Uh, that's it. And, and, and that's, that's how you build your integrity is you have integrity to begin with. You just slowly wrap up by doing a good job. There's no other way. It's like, it's like an exotic car company 
that starts out with just one customer or two customers. That guy takes his exotic car to some kind of race show and they're like, yo, what the fuck is that? He's like, oh, this is Spencer Radolsky started making cars. He's great. And they're like, can I drive it? They're like, yeah, of course, you know, sign the waiver so you don't cost me two and a half million dollars. They drive it and the, the stick just fits. Everything fits. The navigation's amazing. They're like, I need one of these. I live in Dubai. I'm a trillionaire. I fucking need one. And then Spencer built this guy a car who's just as good as the last car. No bullshit, nothing, just performance, raw power, and all that shit that race cars are, are, are amazing with. And then this guy's like, this car's the fucking shit. And then his Sultan friends ask him, so what the fuck is that? And he's like, dude, listen, nobody knows about this car. I paid two and a half million for it. But it's a fucking steal. This is great, great quality. And all of a sudden, you have cars with Car companies literally birthed out of just fucking making good cars. While Ferrari, you know, they make good cars or whatever, they're spending fucking billions on advertising. And for what? This guy didn't do any advertising at all. He just built a good product. If you do good work, if your company is great and actually helps people get in shape with scientific principles, work travels faster than you might think because people are still looking for results at the end of the day. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with that. That's actually how I got my start um, out of college. It Like literally, uh, I went through, uh, you know, we'll say weight loss transformation of, of my own. And I had someone come to me and uh, when I got certified, like I started with just one person. That's it, one person. Mm -hmm. And within the first year of me being a uh, private practice, I was able to completely quit my full-time job and go into training full time uh, 40 hours a week. And that's, you know, I, 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 I agree with, uh, with everything you're saying. I, I feel like just sometimes now, uh, I, now that I'm starting to get a, a little bit bigger following, it's one of those things where like I had that big spike kind of plateau out a, a little bit. And it's like, what do I need to do to, you know, hit, uh, hit that ball out of the park again, right? And it's uh, I I think you're absolutely right. Where it's it's just like uh, diet and exercise in the gym. It's just trust the process and keep going. And eventually, if I continue to put out a good product, it'll it'll happen for me too. I'm kind of I'm kind of in that same position. You know, I don't have 170 some thousand followers like Spencer does, and Mike, I've lost track of where you're at, man. But um, one thing that's always stuck with me and I've, I've seen a lot of growth this year, but it's still, still nothing drastic. But what I have always kind of lived by was that, um, and I'm not even going to try to tell you who said it. I'm sure you guys will know, but you know, it's better to have 10,000 true followers than a hundred thousand just right. You know, followers in general that don't really pay attention. And I've kind of lived by that. Like as far as marketing stuff, you, you have to know who you are. You have to, believe that you know what you're talking about. And yeah, Mike, Mike said it like, it's, there's nothing wrong with making, you know, some cool looking thumbnails to put on and stuff like that. You don't have to totally make shit up. Um, you just have to be consistent. You have to be consistent with your message. You have to be consistent with your approach. And you know what? Slow growth is organic growth. I, yeah. I, don't, I don't know how many people out there I've seen within a month, jump 20, 30,000 followers. And I'm just kind of questioning how much they, they spent on those followers, you know? And, you know, I'm, o I'm okay. I, I see steady growth. I see steady growth on my YouTube channel. I see steady growth on my Instagram. And I know that of those, I think I'm like right under 6,000 right now on Instagram. I know I see a lot of those majority liking all my stuff and commenting and I know that I'm getting through. They're the ones that are constantly asking questions on my Q and a, they're the ones that are, are sending me DMS. They're the ones that are, that I know that I'm reaching. And you know, when I first started coaching a couple years ago, um, I started coaching for free and just to prove. And even with my first prep client, I coached him for free and got word of mouth, you know, and I'm still trying to build up that portfolio, but now I've got actually people paying me. <laughs> um, but I think nowadays people are, are, and I want to say the younger generation, because I've seen a shift since I've been out of the army and actually back into the real world. Like I said, my masters and in coaching and stuff, I see this new generation that's afraid to do stuff for free. They're afraid to do internships. They're afraid to coach people for free to prove themselves. Whereas like that's, that's how I grew up. Like you got to prove yourself. I did multiple internships throughout college before the army. Um, hell, when I started with Lane, I started with him for free. I just, I told him, I was like, Hey, listen, can I take you out for a beer? Kind of pick your brain a little bit. And it just kind of turned into started becoming an assistant for him, started learning the coaching game. We would go over old client, you know, old client case 
files and stuff and look at it and just asking questions and over and over and over and then coaching some people for free. And then you start putting out good content and you refine, you refine your approach to putting out that content and you refine your approach to how you're doing social media in general. And like Mike said, you, you have to be honest, right? And um, Spencer talked about how, you know, you hired your marketing team and it kind of backfired, right? Cause you got two, you got two, I don't know, out there or whatever you want to call it. It wasn't you. Like, yeah. It wasn't he, me. It wasn't anyone. It wasn't you. And people don't, what I'm learning is people don't connect to necessarily like the post so much. They connect to you, right? They come and they follow you. They follow Mike, they follow Spencer. Hopefully more will start following me, but because they believe us, they believe in us and that gets them to read the message below. So that organic growth, I think is something that people don't value as much because that's the stuff that's going to stay right. And it, you're going to constantly be growing like that. Um, and you're going to attract the type of clientele that you want to work with. Right. I get people, I get people that email me that like really have no business or I don't want to work with. Right. Um, but the majority of people that email me know what I'm about. They know my coaching style. They know what I believe in. They know that they're going to have to work that I tell people right away when they sign up with me or thinking about signing up with me. Um, I don't do month to month plans. Three months is the shortest plan that I do because you're not, I'm not going to be this coach that's going to get you drastic results in a month. And I'm upfront and honest with them. And you know what? That's lost me clients. That's lost me potential clients, but those people would have been more headaches than you than, than I would have wanted to take on. Um, but more people respect that, that I'm finding after I explain to them why why I don't do anything shorter than 12. Yeah, they're weeks. signing up for a commitment, right? If they yeah. don't have a commitment, why are they signing up at all? Absolutely. It's a lifestyle commitment. It's a, it's a change, right? Whether it be prep, it's a different lifestyle during prep or whether it's a fat loss or a muscle gain, you know, whatever it is. Um, I'm not going to portray myself as this 30 day fat loss coach. That's not, that's not what I want to pride my education on. That's not what I want to pride my reputation on. Um, I'm in it for the long haul. Just, you know, we have the same, I think the same values at BioLane as you guys do at RP. It's, it's bettering the individual for the long term and sustainability, not just promising these short term, these short term results. Yeah. So let me just make something super clear before, before we all have to get going. The public values of RP or all that bullshit about myths and they get everyone in shape and all that stuff. Privately, we're actually constructing a gigantic world hugging octopus. It's mechanical. Mm -hmm. And it's going to take over the world. Spencer here is actually coaching director. He's in charge of engineering systems for the octopus. Spencer, how's that project coming along now that it's too late to stop it and we can open and talk about it? Yeah, it has, you know, the seven tentacles, but there's one extremely large tentacle that comes out the middle. And I tried oh, yes. to basically model you uh, yeah. in this. And that's why it's probably going to be even better than we thought before. I'm telling you, that one fucking mechanical tentacle, it's going to right through the North Pole is where it's going to go, right into the Earth's hole, so to speak. <laughs> that's right. really the, the end game. Uh, speaking yeah. uh, speaking of end game, uh, we are just about up on our time here. So I'm going to uh, highlight all of you real quick. And uh, so Spencer, where can they find you on social media? Uh, at Dr. Nadolsky. Uh, D R N A D O L S K Y. That's Instagram and Twitter. And then, you know, you can, I'm on Facebook as well, but I say the same thing. So, okay. Instagram's okay. fine. Thank you. Uh, Mike, where can they find you? I'm actually on Tumblr. Uh, I'm just kidding. What the fuck is Tumblr? Um, I'm on Instagram, R P D R M I K E. And then the Renaissance Periodization account, which is actual information versus mostly half naked pictures of me, is uh, RP Strength, at RP Strength. And then I think we're on Twitter or whatever, but Twitter is for adults or something. Twitter's for another generation altogether. Twitter's where you get upset at people. Um, I think Instagram's where you like the pictures. Uh, and then I'm on Facebook too. And the Renaissance Periodization YouTube channel is now releasing like a couple videos every week. Oh, wow. We do a weekly webinars. So just type in Renaissance Periodization or just Darby Strength into the YouTube search function and it'll pop up. See a lot of my face, some of Spencer's face. 
some in some videos we're together and in some videos behind a paywall of course we're doing things that do do doctors do behind closed doors uh, that's great oh my god i love it all right uh so david uh where can people find you uh well first and foremost Pornhub. Uh, <laughs> i'm a subscriber <laughs> no um so on instagram it's at mathis fitness m-a-t-h-a-s fitness um, my, I have a website, www.coachdavidmathis.com and my YouTube, if you just kind of search David Mathis, I'm pretty much the only one to pop up. Um, and email is david at biolane.com. So, awesome. Thank you so much, everyone for, for being here. No, thank you, man. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you so much. Mike and Spencer, it's, uh, it's been an honor. Thank you guys for talking with me a little bit. Likewise. Chat. All right. Noah, thank you. Thank you very much, guys. Enjoy the rest of your day. Have a good one.